in just a few short days, we will be remembering the 53rd anniversary of Apollo 11, the first mission to land on the moon. And over those 53 years, we've learned a lot about that mission, the launch and journey to the moon, on the moon, coming back. We, we know Neil Armstrong's famous words as he stepped foot on the moon, that it was one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. But what we maybe don't know is something that has been forgotten over the course of those 53 years. And that is before they stepped foot on the lunar surface, Buzz Aldrin took communion in the lunar module. He wanted to do something that just emphasized that this was a further exploration of not just science, but of, of seeing God and his creation. And, and he wanted to broadcast it to the world, but after NASA got sued, after the Apollo 8 mission where they read from Genesis as they orbited the Earth on Christmas Day, uh, they, he kept his remarks very general, but privately took communion there on the moon. A link is in the description of this video if you want to see uh, the 1998 From Earth to the Moon series uh, by, that HBO did uh, showing this scene. Uh, communion it was important to him. It's important to us. And we're entering in the, this series called Why Do You Do That? Where we're breaking apart our worship services. And we're doing this for a certain very specific couple reasons. Number one is because there's a lot of us who maybe have done this really um, very frequently for our lives. We've, we've done it routinely and sometimes when we do things routinely we forget its meaning. But others of us perhaps we're brand new to church or at least maybe at least 40 and so we do some things, say some things that are a little bit different than you're used to and, and so we want to take this time to just analyze some things that we do that may not make sense to someone or maybe that we've forgotten the importance of it over the course of time. And so today we're talking about communion. And in order to do that, we're going to take a look at something that Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Paul's in the middle of a discussion about how the Corinthian church is divided. We're going to take a look at that in a second. And he uses communion as an example that when they gathered together for the Lord's Supper, they, they weren't doing a, a very good job of, of doing it in the right way. And so he wants them to remember what happened the very first communion. So that the very first Lord's Supper, the Lord's Supper, so that they remember why it's so important that they do what they do. And so in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul recounts this story. We're going to read it in its entirety, and then we're going to go and break it down bit by bit. Paul says this, For I received from the Lord what I passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So let's break down this together. But firstly, we observe communion because we're called to. Paul says, I receive, For I received from the Lord what I passed down to you or passed on to you. Receiving a passing is in the context of traditions. Traditions passed down from person to person, generation to generation. Paul says, I received this message, and he says from the Lord. And so there's some uh, a bit of uncertainty exactly how he heard it, whether it was from Jesus himself, who, and we just don't have a record in scripture, that Jesus said, this is what happened on the night that I was betrayed in my last supper with my disciples, or it was somebody that was in the room where it happened, that they said, hey, I, this is what happened. I'm going to pass this on to you. However he received it, he, he considers it from the Lord, and now he's passed it down to the church in Corinth. And not only the church in Corinth, we get the impression that he passed it to every church that he went and he started. He, he said, hey, listen, this is something that I have been told that I need to remember. This is something you need to remember. So Paul passes this down, the, the importance of remembering this meal when they got together. Later on in verse 26, or the first part of 26, he says, For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup. It's a reminder that this is something to happen with regularity. It's not something that is uh, observed once or in, or in the past and that's it. No, this is something that the people who follow Jesus are supposed to be doing with regularity. 
And I know that you perhaps have a different tradition than East 40. East 40, we take communion every week. Perhaps you grew up in a church where you took it once a month or once a quarter, something like that. But, but let me tell you why East 40 does it once a week. It's simply because as we look through the early church, we think that when they got together, they did this. In Acts 2.42, it tells us about the gatherings of the very first kind of ch church, the first group of Christians. It says that they devoted themselves to the apostles' teachings and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. The breaking of bread was the remembrance of Jesus. It was the observance of the Lord's Supper. It was often in the midst of a larger meal, but there was always a, a time set apart for this. Luke, who wrote the book of Acts, remembers his journeys with Paul. And, and in Acts chapter 20, he says, On the first day of the week, we came together to break bread. It's something that they did. And so every time East 40 gathers on a Sunday morning, we take communion because we are called to. We're, we're called to remember that Lord's Supper and all that it means. The second thing that this reminds us of, Paul recalling the very first or the, the Lord's Supper, the Last Supper with Jesus and his disciples, it reminds us that when we observe communion, it reminds us that all are welcome. Paul is using a very specific meal. He says, the Lord Jesus on the night he was betrayed. So this is, we see Jesus eating a lot through scripture, eating at people's houses and gathering together. But, but Paul is saying, no, this is a very specific meal that he took part in. It was a meal that he ate with his disciples on the night he was betrayed. It, it, he gives the parameters of it. Now, it also reminds us of who was at that meal. And when we come together and we gather around communion, we're, we're reminded that communion reminds us we're, we're all welcome. Everyone is welcome here. Everyone washed by the blood of Christ are welcome at God's table because it's not our table. It's, it's the Lord's table. Think about who was there. There was Judas, the betrayer, Peter, the one who would deny him in a few short hours, Thomas, who was ever skeptical, all the disciples who we have in scripture all but one it seems ran away in just a few short hours and left Jesus to die alone on the cross and yet Jesus ate with them he sat and he ate this meal together it's a reminder that when we come to this table we come at the invitation of Jesus and it doesn't matter where we came from or what we've done we are welcome there because we are in his blood in 2011 or 12, I preached about communion at Bowling Green Christian Church, where I was the youth minister. I was filling in one Sunday. And we were in a point in our, our church history that was a bit contentious. There was a lot of division that was happening, generational uh, worship styles, things like that. And when I thought about, thought about talking about communion, I thought about how that was in such a stark contrast. This place where everyone was welcome, everybody was equal, is in such stark contrast with the atmosphere and the attitude of so many people. And so I wrote down this night before this poem that um, just kind of popped into my head. And it's probably not a very good one, but it, it's something that has always reminded me of what communion is about. Now, these are the words I wrote. It says, this table brings together the young and old, the weak and the bold. This table brings together the traditionalists and the rockers, the prodigal sons and their fathers. This table brings together the hurting and the healed, those who are on fire, those who have chilled. This table brings together red, yellow, black, and white, all who are beautiful in a sight. This table brings together saints and sinners, old believers and new seekers. This table brings together three-piece suits and blue jeans, old believers, brand, uh, or sorry, elderly and teens. This table brings together sinners to Christ, the dead to their life. This table brings together who we are with what we will be. This table brings together all of you and all of me. We observe communion because it's a reminder that Jesus ate with this assortment of characters, most of which who would sin against him and leave him and abandon him in just a few hours, and yet he ate with them because this is the Lord's supper, and he invites everyone to come. So we observe communion because we're called to. We observe communion because it is our reminder that everyone's welcome. You also observe communion by taking the bread. And we take the bread because it's a, a reminder of Jesus' physical sacrifice. Paul says, The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. 
When we take that bread, we remember Jesus' physical sacrifice. Jesus came here in a physical body. He put on flesh and dwelled among us. Paul refers to Jesus just a couple chapters earlier as the Passover lamb. And it was the Passover that Jesus was observing with his disciples that night. This Passover that pointed back to the Exodus story and God delivering them out of Exodus and uh, out of Egypt. And, and how it was the blood of the lamb smeared over the doorpost of their homes that caused death to pass over them and, and to kill the firstborn of any home that it wasn't covered with the blood of the lamb. Jesus is our Passover lamb. It was his body handed over to the authorities, handed over to us, really, to be killed on the cross, to be crucified, so that we could be set free. Now, Jesus' body wasn't broken. The Bible tells us that there wasn't a bone in his body broken, but it was busted open. It was pierced. It was slashed by the whippings and the nails and the crown of thorns. And yet, why does Jesus, if his body wasn't broken, break the bread? Well, it's quite simply this. He... He breaks the bread so that everyone can have a piece of that one body. It's a reminder that that one body ties together every single one of us. One sacrifice for the many. Now, the reason that Paul's having to go through this discussion is because the Corinthian church, probably a lot like our churches, have forgotten that. He mentions in verse 20, he says, When you come together, it's not the Lord's Supper you eat. You're not doing it right. And the reason was because when they came together, like I said, the Lord's Supper was, or the, the breaking of bread, the Lord's Supper was a part of a grander meal that would take place. But everybody would bring their own meal. And in the church in Corinth in particular, there were people who had a lot and there were people who had very little. And so when people came together, those who had a lot had a lot of food. Those who didn't have much didn't have a lot of food. And so they would finish eating quicker and they would probably be more hungry as they would continue to sit around and wait for all these other people to eat all their food, maybe overindulge in their food, and they go home stuffed. And this was causing a division, not just because of the economic differences, because of the differences in the amount of food that was being eaten, but also at the heart of what was happening there. See, the issue was that the people who had plenty didn't care that people didn't have as much. They didn't care that people were still hungry. They were just focused on themselves and their meal. And so Paul says, listen, it's not the Lord's Supper you're eating because when you're coming together, there's divisions. And we need to be reminded in the recounting of the story, Jesus took his body, his bread, the bread, where it represents his body, and he broke it and gave it to everyone saying, this unites you. So if you're doing anything that doesn't unite you, that doesn't belong here. And so when we gather together and we take the bread, we were reminded that it comes from this, the same loaf, the bread of life, Jesus. It unites us under his lordship. We don't take different types of bread. We don't take different types of, because there's not different types of salvation. There's the only one. There's the way, the truth, and the life. And so we are all united with God through Jesus and his sacrifice. So we observe communion by taking the bread to remember that there was a physical sacrifice made on our behalf. Secondly, we also remember uh, communion by drinking from the cup, which reminds us of the new covenant. Paul says, in the same way after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. When we take the cup, we remember the new covenant. And now, because there's a new covenant, we obviously know that there was an old covenant. An old covenant that was founded in the Old Testament. One in which the sign of the old covenant was the circumcision of every Jewish male. And the deals of the old covenant was the law. These were the laws that the people of God were supposed to follow. We know the Ten Commandments, but there are hundreds more that they were supposed to continue to follow. And, and when they didn't, because inevitably they could not, they would have to come and make amends for that. They would have to prepare, find an animal with a very specific set of uh, specifications. They're, they had to prepare it in a very specific way. They had to give it to a priest who had to sacrifice it in a very specific way. And then as they left the place of sacrifice, they just kind of had to hope that it was good enough. Hope that it was prepared in the right way with the right heart. There was, there's really no kind of guarantee in this. Well, Jesus says, now there's a new covenant. And the thing with the new covenant is we don't have to worry about the quality of the sacrifice. Because the new covenant is not based on anything that we've done or anything we can bring. It's based upon Jesus. It's based upon his sacrifice. And we know 
that not only was he blameless as far as a sin aspect, but he was a pleasing sacrifice to God, that it was the Lord's will to crush him, to cause him to suffer so that we could have a relationship with him. His blood is a reminder that this is the new covenant, that it's not up to us, that he has paid the price for each and every one of us. And so now, being found in him, we can be forgiven. The blood of Jesus is a theme throughout the New Testament. Hebrews tells us, Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most high place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way opened up for us through the curtain that is his body, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with the full assurance that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. The writer of Hebrews tells us it's through the blood of Jesus that we can approach God's holy place with confidence, that we can commune with him, talk with him, be with him. John says, but if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. It is an amazing image in scripture, and obviously John wouldn't be thinking about this back then, but it's almost like a windshield wiper. This word it purifies, it's an ongoing verb, it's purifying, continuing to purify us, and so it's like when rain hits a windshield, and the good wipers don't smear it, and they completely get rid of it. That's what Jesus' blood does to our lives. It keeps the sin off. Paul writes in Ephesians 2, But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far away, have been brought near by the blood of Christ. See, if the blood of Christ changes everything for us. It gives us a relationship with God, confidence before God, forgiveness for our sins. It brings us near, and we are called family because of his blood, because of the new covenant. So when we take the cup, we remember that covenant. And really what we do when we observe communion is we proclaim the gospel. Paul recalls, he says, for whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death. Every time that we come forward and, and we take communion together, we proclaim the Lord's death, we proclaim the gospel. There within that meal, like crackers and the juice, is this larger statement that we believe that Jesus came here in the flesh. He died the death reserved for the gravest, gravest of sinners so that being found in him, by believing in him, we can now have a relationship with God today and forever, being forgiven for our sins and receiving a living hope for eternity. All of that statement is represented in what we do when we come to the table. It is a presentation and proclamation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. But when we take communion, we don't just look back. And we don't just look at here and now. We also look towards the future. We observe communion by looking forward to Jesus' return. Paul recalls this. He says, for whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Jesus gives us this. And he, he says, this is what you're going to do until, until I come again. See, communion, as great as it is and significant as it is, it is a placeholder until there is a greater meal that is to come. And we see an imagery of this meal in Revelation chapter 19. There, John is giving an image. Uh, he's giving a preview. He's giving maybe a firsthand account of what, uh, look at what is going to happen when Jesus makes all things new and sets all things right. And right before Jesus goes off to defeat every form of evil, every everything that is evil, all the results of sin and death and all of these things, there is this image. It says, John sees this. He says, Then I heard what sounded like a great multitude, or like a roar of rushing waters, like loud peals of thunder, shouting, Hallelujah, for the Lord God Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory for the wedding lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready fine linen bright and clean was given her to wear fine linen stands for the righteous act of God's holy people the angel said to me write this blessed are those who are invited to the wedding supper of the lamb and he added these are the true words of God he says this is a, a, the wedding supper of the lamb this feast this banquet is getting ready to happen and it's this celebration of the perfect now relationship through the blood of Jesus, this relationship between Jesus and the church, his bride. And everyone is welcome here. See, when we take part of communion, we do remember 
back to the cross. We do remember what it means for us today, but we also look forward to this, this grand meal that one day we will participate in as those saved by the blood of Jesus, washed white and clean. We look forward to that. So when we come and we take communion, it's not just a ritual. It's not just something mundane. It's something highly significant. We come to this table and we remember what it means. We come to this table because we're called to. We come to this table because it reminds us all are welcome. We come to this table because we remember the body given for us, the blood shed for us, that Jesus' physical death was a sacrifice, that his blood spiritually makes us clean, that we proclaim that this is the gospel that the world needs to hear and that we've received and we look forward to one day his coming. This idea of a meal, it inter, it's interwoven throughout Jesus' ministry. He references it in different talks and different images, one of which was a, a parable about uh, somebody who was preparing a banquet. And people had been invited. They said they were going to come. And so he sends a servant out and says, it's time. But those people who said that they were coming didn't show up. They said they had something else to do. And so the man's disgusted. He's angry. He sends the servants out and say, invite more people. Well, some people come, some people don't come. And, and they come back and the servant says, I've invited others. And the man looks over and says, there's still empty seats. Go out one more. And he goes to alleyways and all the, the probably least desirable areas of town. And he says, come and eat. And, and the, the truth was that the master wanted the house to be full. And that's what God wants. That on that banquet day, on the wedding supper of the Lamb, he wants those chairs to be full. And I hope that you, I hope that you watching this, that you will, that you will receive that message, that truth, that you will come to Jesus, accept his invitation to make him his, your Lord and your Savior, to be found in him, baptized into him so that you can experience the meal that is to come and so that you can eat together with those of us who have received that message now so we can gather together to remember him every time we come around the Lord's table.